Welcome and thank you for uh, joining our short discussion on the ongoing um, issue of the coronavirus, or is COVID, known as COVID-19 as well. Um, so hopefully with this, you know, as part of the supporting the community, helping the community, um, looking at just a very brief, I know there's been quite a, a lot of information overload recently with regards to the illness, so we're not going to talk in too much detail about the illness itself, um, but mainly over the important aspects of the illness. Um, I myself was, or continue to be, someone who suffers with the illness, uh, so I will speak to you about some of, share with you some of my experiences of the illness, what sort of symptoms I've had, um, and hopefully that can help some of you maybe relate, uh, you know, were you to be, um, to suffer with any of this, um, or, or suffer with the condition itself. Um, we have a panel of uh, colleagues as well who will also be jumping in at various points and hopefully um, adding, adding to, so you don't hear my mundane voice throughout the whole talk. Um, please, if you have any questions, I mean, this is mainly as well for you to be able to ask your own personal questions about concerns that might be specific to your own um, circumstances. So if you have any of those, please feel free to um, bring those to light in advance uh, so that we can try and hopefully answer as many of those questions as possible. And uh, and yeah, so um, I'm going to try and just bring up this presentation that my colleague has also helped uh, about. Let me just see if it's showing there. And let's try that now. Okay, are we seeing the, are you seeing the full screen there just quickly? Yes, we can see the screen. Yeah, go okay. Ahead. Okay, so we're just going to go through some, you know, very basic essentials about this illness in itself. And then, um, as I say, focus more on the important aspects with, with regards to everyone's daily life. Um, so first and foremost, we're going to talk about, as I say, the COVID-19, what it is. A very brief look at some of the statistics things that can be done to um, help prevent, avoid further exposure and further um, dissemination of the illness, spreading of the illness, and then specific advice on what you can do, each and every one of you can do to help protect yourselves and, and loved ones and, and the community as well. Faraz, can I just interrupt one second? Could yeah. I ask all participants to switch off uh, their video uh, for now, just to reduce um, the sort of uh, uh, impact on the on the broadband. Sorry for us, Karen. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, as we pretty much have heard through the news numerous times and, and on a regular basis, it's spread from person to person through small droplets. When we say small droplets, we're talking about things that are very fine mists of, of, of small, small um, particles that we can't typically see with our naked eye. Um, such as when you sneeze and when you cough. Now, there's been, most of the evidence that until now has been showing that it, it is through via these, this aerosol, these small droplets, um, that, that um, infection takes place or spreading takes place. Um, and those droplets then themselves land on various surfaces. And depending on the type of surface and the make of the surface, it can last anywhere from a couple of hours to, to, to you know, several hours to, to many, many hours. So, um, but recently as well, there's been evidence to show that there is potential or there might be a possibility of, of spread of, of a fine airborne spread, not necessarily in the same way as um, other airborne illnesses. It means that within a relatively confined space that that um, 
those micro droplets or those uh, that small aerosol can linger in the air for a much, much longer period than previously um, thought, which obviously increases the risk of contagion and, and infection. Um, so as you've heard through the news, uh, about most people recover from this fully without the need of requiring any hospital admission, without re the requirement for any further treatment apart from simple medications uh, that you can buy over the counter in pharmacies. But a proportion of people as well um, will require additional um, specialized input, which is mainly re relating to the breathing or oxygenation um, uh, which is either in the form of supplemental oxygen, so giving you additional oxygen to try and help support your system, or in the form of, um, in the extreme form of needing to intubate or putting a tube down the throat to, uh, and using special machines to vent do the ventilation for you. Um, so hopefully the majority of people will, will not require any, anything more than just the simple uh, treatments at home, but a small proportion of people will require more more specialist um, help. Um, so the, the, with currently the situation in the UK, as you all pr pretty heard, or pretty much heard about with regards to the testing, um, testing is now stopped. We're not really doing much in the way of testing of the community as it stands, unless you're needing that admission into hospital. Um, only then, if you if you, you do require hospital admission, will we or will testing take place? So we don't really know the number of people that are um, uh, have caught the illness or are currently suffering or carrying the illness at the moment. Um, contrary to what we might have heard, there has been some uh, suggestions that this illness has been with us for longer than the more recent um, history that we've heard now. So some say as early as January, uh, the illness could have already been in the country and, and already beginning to spread amongst the population. But obviously, um, these, these are things that are yet to be seen as we do more and more research, as, as more and more becomes apparent about the illness itself. Um, so, and again, as we've heard in the, in the media, the death rate does depend on age groups. Uh, the, the, the younger you are, the less likely uh, for more serious complications. And as we progress in age, that um, the risk becomes much higher. Um, contrary to previous belief as well that the young are immune, um, we're seeing more and more evidence that there are um, more and more cases of, of younger people being requiring that hospital admission um, as, as recently as maybe today where a 13 year old has been the first or the youngest to die of the illness. Uh, but really we're talking from the age of 20 upwards. Most people below that age or in the teenagers and, and younger children are very mildly affected by the illness and in some cases um, almost show no symptoms at all or even milder than um, your typical coughing cold that children uh, commonly get. So what can we do to sort of help prevent the spread of the illness? Um, Really, the essential thing is ensuring that when you are in contact with the various surfaces, um, needing to go outside for, for either a medical emergency or doing some essential shopping or doing your exercise is to make sure that your hands are regularly washed. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you become very OCD about washing your hands and anything every every time you touch a certain surface you're immediately spraying your hands with an alcohol sanitizing gel and uh, you know eventually you will uh, you'll, you'll cause yourself a little bit of harm to your hands there but it does mean that you need to be very careful about the surfaces you touch and and about touching yourself and making sure that those hands are kept away from the face 
in the mouth. Um, so as to prevent were there to be any were there to be any illness, um, any of the virus on the hands that you prevent bringing that within to your system. Um, now, social distancing or isolation or keeping away is really one of the major points in, in preventing the spread from person to person. Um, it, is, it is an essential part of containing the disease and helping prevent the illness. Now, as we said, the younger people tend to be uh, a lot more, a lot less likely to develop any serious complications, but that doesn't prevent them from transmitting that illness to, to um, numerous uh, others who might not be so young and might not be so immune either. Um, if you do develop any symptoms of coughing and sneezing or, or even, even the very you know, find symptoms, then it is essential that you ensure as much as possible to prevent that aerosolization when you cough and sneeze, that those fine droplets from um, you know, moving away into the general region of where you are. So, um, you know, if, if you do develop any symptoms, regardless of how minor they might seem to you and how, how um, insignificant, it is essential you do at that point, self-isolate, um, and if you're, you know, at home with with family, then you need to self-isolate um, for a minimum of seven days, and the rest of the the remainder of the family should then self-isolate for not less than fourteen days, uh, just to ensure that no spread is taking place and they they don't develop any symptoms in the meantime, because that is, you know, it's expected that within those fourteen days symptoms would, are likely to develop um, and obviously to try and as much as possible avoid the spread within the family by keeping your distance um, or wearing surgical masks uh, and or protecting yourself from coughing within the house when you're uh, you have vulnerable people or you know just to try and help prevent that spread um, the times when you should be looking at seeking medical attention is if you develop at any point difficulty in breathing. Now, with this illness, one of the most common things is, is developing is, is the cough, is that you develop a cough. Um, but hopefully, like most coughs and colds, those things um, are self-limiting and you, don't you typically don't require anything more than just bed rest taking regular medications and, and just um, trying to boost your immunity and help yourself in that period. But if were you to develop uh, problems where you felt it difficult to breathe um, or, or your, re your breathing rate was significantly faster, you felt as if you were breathing a lot more to, to achieve the same, um, same thing that you would typically otherwise uh, achieve with normal breathing, then it is best at that point to seek medical attention. Um, so stay at home, avoid public spaces, self-isolation and uh, for seven days for yourself. And if you're within a family, 14 days. Um, we've heard about the underlying people with underlying conditions or the people who are at a higher risk of developing these complications, uh, more serious complications. And as we can see on the graph, hopefully, or you can see there, that um, based on the, the specific conditions there, the, the increase, the percentage increase of, of people suffer, of developing these more, more serious complications and death even, um, are significantly higher than people who do not have these conditions. This by, by, by no means is uh, a exhaustive list. It's only bringing to point several of, of more common conditions, but there are a lot more conditions there that um, would fall into that category. And hopefully, you know, we can um, discuss those if, if anyone has any questions uh, at the end um, but also you can find a lot of the information on the NHS website um, and, and uh, a lot of that will be explained in detail there as well.
So, so other more serious um, and, and even more riskier group than the people with underlying conditions are those who are immunosuppressed. Um, so typically, if you've had an organ transplant of some kind, you would be on medication to help to suppress the immune system so as to not reject that organ. That immunosuppression uh, to uh, help prevent organ rejection at the same time suppresses your immunity overall. And that means you're a lot less able to fight off um, illnesses and infections. And, and even very simple infections can sometimes even become fatal at that time. Um, as this is mainly a, a, a virus that affects the lungs and the breathing, any conditions, any serious conditions of the lung, such as fibrosis or severe asthma, brittle asthma is sometimes called, are also at a much higher risk. Um, um, and uh, pregnant women are, the, the recent advice is they, they should be in self-isolation for three months, no less. So um, we've just brought up, I don't know if these are clickable. I don't think you can click them from here, but we'll leave them in the, I, I, I don't know um, if uh, Amir, we can leave these at the end somewhere for people to be able to access. It might be an idea if someone just takes a, a photo of the screen at this stage. Um, I'll try and work that out later. Firaz, the other thing that can be done is if you, um, you can copy and paste this links directly into the chat function. So if yes, you go to the panel and press okay. chat, and then from the original, Actually, you continue the presentation and I'll do that. Fantastic, uh, thank you. Okay, so these are just some very simple things because I mean, we hear medical uh, people speak about uh, respiratory rate, the pulse, um, and, and we talk about good hand hygiene, but what specifically do those things mean? Um, and these, these particular points, especially the respiratory rate or how fast you're breathing per minute, and your pulse are important um, vital statistics or, or um, signs that we look for for deterioration or worsening of an illness. So especially if you need to contact a professional to discuss your case, um, your, for example, your GP, it would be extremely helpful for them to be able to assess the severity of your illness if you're able to give them information like a precise, a more precise rate of respiration and a more precise um, estimate of what your pulse is doing at the moment, in addition to things like your temperature and things that can be measured otherwise. Um, uh, and also there's a good link here about washing your, the appropriate way to wash your hands to ensure that you are um, maintaining hand cleanliness as much as, as, as physically possible. Um, so hopefully those links will be in the, in the uh, in the chat and, and, and most of you can access it. If you can't, um, we'll, we'll look at ways to disseminate those. So typical symptoms of COVID-19, um, they vary from person to person. And uh, in, my per in my experience, they, they're slightly different from what uh, you might have heard on the news. Uh, and I'll speak to, to, to you about those in a minute. But um, these are the common experiences that people, people will develop um, having been infected with the illness and start to develop symptoms. So the, the two most important ones, the, the most common ones are a high fever and dry cough. Uh, and we talk, when we talk about a high fever, that's anything usually above 37.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and that, that temperature can vary from person to person as we say and can be non-existent. These, these, these symptoms do not necessarily mean having these, all these symptoms is a good suggestion that you, you do have the illness, but having only one of these symptoms in itself doesn't rule out the illness whatsoever, um, as we'll see later. Um, so typically a dry cough and high fever are the common, most common features of the illness. Fatigue and tiredness is, a, is another a common experience um, or symptom of the illness where you feel very just drained and without any energy. Um, some people experience only gastrointestinal symptoms, which include things like vomiting and diarrhea or just the feeling of nausea and sickness without actually having um, 
diarrhea and vomiting. Um, more and more recently, they, they st it's still not an official uh, symptom of COVID-19, which is the loss of taste and smell, but there's a lot of evidence to show that many people do experience the both loss of taste and smell as well. And the more serious ones, uh, as, a seri as the illness progresses, and if, in some cases, can you can develop difficulty in breathing, as we've mentioned earlier. Um, not on the list is also things like a headache. Headache is another common feature of, of the um, illness and aches and pains of joints and, and various parts of the body. Um, so those are additional symptoms. But the, as I say, the list isn't exhaustive and will vary from person to person. So when we talk about red flags, what are red flags? Red flags are the things, the warning signs, the things that sort of bring us to attention, that make us slightly concerned as, as clinicians, as doctors, the things that we don't like to see. Um, and when we look at breathing in specific, it's, it's when, when a person is struggling to breathe, it's find, finding it hard to breathe. Um, and that can either be, as I said earlier, where you're finding that your breathing rate is a lot faster, or you're just finding that it's very difficult for you to take in a complete deep breath, and that you're, you're struggling to take in that deep breath. Um, wheezing, if there's an audible wheezing sound, if any of you has ever been um, heard an asthmatic person, then it's that whistling sound that comes from the chest. Um, when you're commonly when you're breathing out, you will hear a slight whistling sound, or you might feel that whistling sound in the in the chest. Um, not able to talk in complete sentences, and that suggests that you are lacking oxygen and you, you need to stop in between sentences to take in an additional breath of air so that you can compensate for that lack of oxygen. And sometimes things like coughing up small amounts of blood or, or, more, or larger amounts of blood can be, again, examples of more serious illness. Um, when it comes to things surrounding the heart, it's palpitations. When we, we talk about palpitations, uh, basically that's an irregular heartbeat where the, the heart is beating in a, not a steady, regular rhythm, but an, an erratic and un, um, w without any particular uh, rhythm to it. Um, that sometimes in itself can cause dizziness or fainting. And again, that suggests that the heart isn't doing the function it should be doing. Um, and, and those are concerning. Significant chest pains. Now, um, like I said earlier, with this illness, people will experience some degree of chest discomfort, chest um, tightness. Uh, but any, anything that's quite severe and, and very painful um, is, is a concerning sign. And um, cyanosis, which is basically a lack of oxygen, a, a suggestion of a lack of oxygen in the system, is something that you see on the limbs and the tips and the small, uh, small, particles, small parts of the body, for example, the tips of the fingers or the lips, or as you've heard, the lips turning blue. Um, those are signs of, again, of a, of a decrease of, of the blood flow to the area and a decrease of the oxygen level. Um, other things uh, that can suggest serious illness um, are, are confusion. That's my, that might be something that you yourself might not um, see about yourself, but it's something that you might notice in your loved one or your colleague or you know, your relative. Um, unable to pass urine or passing very small amounts of urine. Uh, and on obviously more serious things like unconsciousness. Um, a very high fever that isn't improving with paracetamol. The advice really now is to take only simple paracetamol to help with the fever. Um, so uh, people have suggested in the past uh, things like ibuprofen that might be taken. But there isn't yet, um, not to say that you cannot take ibuprofen, but the suggestion is if, if not needed, it's best to avoid ibuprofen at the moment, as there, there's not, there might be some evidence to show that it can have an effect on the illness itself. So if you're not taking it um, and do not need to be taking it, then it's best to avoid ibuprofen for the time being, 
until more studies can be done. But again, it's best to consult with your um, doctor or if you have particular questions at the end, you can ask about with regards to ibuprofen. Um, and severe headache, severe headache that isn't, again, improving with simple things like paracetamol. Um, we said that younger children um, are typically not affected in a severe way, but again, it's important to look out for the signs and symptoms that they might otherwise not be able to express or tell you. Um, so in, in very small children and babies, that could be things like not, not willing to feed regularly, not able to, not, not taking any fluids, not wetting their nappies, not, not passing much in the way of urine again, lethargic, not, not showing, not expressing um, typical uh, energetic activity, not, not being as energetic as usual, any rashes that are not going away, um, which we call non-blanching rashes. So if you press on it, it doesn't, um, if you press on it with a glass, the rash is still evident um, with, a, with a glass cup, for example, you press down on the area of the rash, and that rash you can still see underneath the glass. That's a suggestion that the rash, the rash isn't blanching, and that's um, something that you need to seek medical attention about urgently. Um, again, fast breathing, and that can be seen usually in the way that the chest is moving, and in the way that the stomach sometimes is seesawing in and out. That means they're, they're using a lot more additional muscles to help pull in that air because they're finding it difficult to breathe. Um, and, and again, looking at that blue tinge, not that typical nice, healthy pink looking skin. Um, and being, again, floppy, uh, which goes back to the lethargic aspect of things. Uh, by no means is this list exhaustive, and if you are not sure of your symptoms, the important thing is to seek um, medical attention, whether that be through contacting your GP, 111, or uh, making way to a hospital if, if you feel that that's um, needed. Um, <clears throat> so things that we can do are um, optimizing, if you, if you do suffer with a, a a chronic condition is to ensure that you try and optimize that condition, making sure that you're taking the medications that you're requiring to, to take for that condition um, uh, and having the regular follow-up uh, with your GP or with, your, with the specialist um, and seeking advice about how to uh, ensure that you're minimizing that condition as much as possible. Taking care of your diet. I mean, we all know that diet and exercise are essential parts of not just only our physical, but mental well-being. Um, if you're smoking, to stop smoking. These are all very much uh, common sense things, but it's important to stress the, how, how uh, important they are in, in boosting your immune system and ensuring that you're well prepared. Um, multivitamins might help the immune system but really taking, ensuring that you're taking vitamins through their natural, um, uh, in their natural environment, so fruits and vegetables, um, and ensuring that you're ma maintaining uh, a good fluid intake, drinking plenty of water. Um, <clears throat> as I say, keeping, keeping drink, drinking regularly and ensuring that you're well hydrated. Uh, taking very simple home remedies, um, Things like honey and lemon are, have been proven to be a lot more effective in suppressing cough or helping with the cough than the medications you might typically buy over the counter in your pharmacy. Um, ensuring that you get adequate rest, uh, sleeping very well, and taking paracetamol, as I say, to help control some of the aches and pains and the fevers and um, just the general discomfort that comes along with an illness. Uh, things like other, other things that might help uh, improve your symptoms and your condition if you were you to be affected by the illness are things like steam inhalation that can help agitate or move some of the mucus buildup in the chest and help al allow you, for you to bring that mucus up and, and uh, make it easier for you to breathe. 
Uh, nasal decongestions by simple blowing out of the nose using saline sprays. Um, antihistamines are medications that are usually taken for conditions, uh, allergic conditions um, and or hay fever. They can also help. Um, cough syrups, uh, and some people do find beneficial, but as I say earlier, probably looking at uh, natural remedies are, are, are easier to take, uh, a bit more effective in some cases. Um, so all very common sense things really. Um, Non-emergency cases, so if you do have concerns about something deteriorating, something that's not quite right, you're not entirely sure, you can't find the answer of, of any of the symptoms that you've developed and you're not sure what to do next. So the best thing to do is to contact 111 um, and or your local GP. Um, obviously, as the with the current situation, um, NHS 111 and, and GP surgeries are, are absolutely inundated with calls and um, you, you will very likely experience an extremely long wait to get through to those services in the current environment we're in, unfortunately but that's just because of the sheer volume of calls and, and uh, questions that are coming through on those numbers. Um, but if, if any of those red flags, as we mentioned earlier, develop, then you need to seek medical attention uh, ASAP, and that's by uh, dialing 999 uh, and or attending a &E as soon as possible. Um, these are some more resources that we can probably add to the, uh, the chat box for people to look at later. Um, I'm sure Amber uh, will be able to do that. Thank you. And um, thank you very much. There's also a small survey at the end who I uh, hope uh, Amber, if you could please kindly add to the chat. Uh, we'd we'll be grateful if we could all, um, you know, at the end maybe uh, press on the link and, and give your feedback because that will help us in um, not specifically with this presentation um, or this this um, this uh, meeting that we're having at the moment, but it's more looking at the NHS and helping with the NHS um, and help fighting the illness in itself. I'm gonna pause for a moment and leave it for my colleagues to just, uh, if they have anything additional they'd like to add to, to what I've said so far. Zakhalar, <clears throat> thanks so much uh, for us. If I could invite uh, the rest of the panel members um, just to um, add in, uh, and then we'll open it up for Q&A after that. Uh, Atia, did you have uh, some comments? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Just checking. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so I mean, I think um, from the GP point of view, we're getting quite a lot of, um, I think patients are quite confused about where they should be going. So I think the information um, that Firas just gave was quite helpful. So if you, um, if you have symptoms not related to coronavirus, then your GP surgery should be your first point of contact. Um, if you think that you have coronavirus, but you're not unwell, then you should just remain at home. And if you don't need to speak to anybody, then there's no need to inform your surgery. Just treat it as you would a normal cold or um, flu illness. Um, but obviously, if you're Although, much more unwell, yeah. then you... Sorry? Hello. Hi. Sorry. I'm Seema. Sorry. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry. Carry on. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I was just saying that um, if, you, if you are not sure, um, if you have a, a coronavirus illness and you think you're becoming more unwell in the way that Firas outlined, then your first point of call should be 111. Um, I know that some people are having... Um, Should be the 111 online symptom check. Yes, or um, by calling 111. But 111 online has very good advice about whether you should be, um, with the, whether you need to be seen or not. Um, the other thing you can get from 111 is an isolation note. Um, so a lot of people are contacting us saying that they've been told to self-isolate or the household needs to isolate. Um, that can be obtained from 111 um, and you don't need to contact anybody to get that. You just print it off or have a copy emailed to your, um, to your own email address. Um, Seema, did you have anything to add? Yes, I did actually want to mention the fact that um, 111 online symptom check is actually really very good. And 
if you if you actually go through the checker and it finds out that you're quite unwell then what they suggest that is that you actually contact 111 on the phone and wait to speak to a nurse um, and the other point about the isolation note is that you can actually self-certify for the first seven days of an illness and then you can self-certify then you can get an isolation note off the website so you don't actually have to contact the GP at all for any of this. So it helps kind of unload the burden from primary care. Amr, can I interrupt? Can I? Uh, my name is Dr. Hassan. I'm one of the uh, anesthetic consultants. There's a query from somebody, SB, uh, if you can actually read his uh, query. I'm not sure what exactly he means that uh, he or she means that uh, I've heard many cases where people that are not directly that have attended the hospital and have been given an injection before they put into the ventilator. Immediately after this, they collapsed and passed away. Uh, I don't think that's actually right. So, so if I can just jump in there, if we, we, we'll we'll get to um, questions and answers just at the uh, just once we finish. A discussion. Oh, sorry. sorry to have interrupted. Sorry. No, not at all. Not at all. But we're we're just going to um, you know we'll we'll leave that. Uh, hopefully, dedicate most of the questions and answers. Um, you know, because that's I'm sure there's lots of questions that people might have. Indeed. Um, we'll leave does it anyone to... else would, would there would, would, any additional comments that would be very useful? If, if anyone else has, thank you so far. I mean, that's been very useful advice with regards to the NHS one 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 NHS website and one one one. But is there any additional comments with regards to the advice we've given so far that anyone would like to uh, add? Mizan, it's your um, presentation. Can you uh, elaborate on any of those points? Uh, I think uh, Dr. Faraz uh, did a very uh, well-rounded job of uh, explaining uh, kind of where we are now, uh, summarizing some of the symptoms uh, that we all kind of the infect whoever's in infected with this uh, may get and it's a very wide spectrum and one of the challenges uh, the fact that it's um, there is a lot of similarity with a uh, many other causes of colds and coughs um, majority of which can be or usually are self-limiting too um, and I think the self-care advice is really important because the vast majority of patients um, the vast majority of us who do get uh, affected by this infection, the care advice that Dr. Firas went over would be applicable. Um, so just kind of uh, keeping well hydrated, trying to control your fever, um, trying those home remedies, um, isolating yourself, um, and keeping a close eye on yourself or family members to ensure that things aren't getting worse, and if they do get worse, seeking help. Um, so nothing too much more to add. Um, and again, I think. Um, Can I just add this small point when you finish? Yeah, sure. Um, I was just going to say that um, I would advise everybody to check the advice for um, the groups on the um, the government public health um, England website for which groups are shielding, uh, which is the people who should not have any contact with the outside um, for twelve weeks. And there's also another group which is um, of more vulnerable, vulnerable who should avoid um so who should isolate as far as possible um so there are some people in that category who may not know that they're in that category so obviously we have people who are have chronic illnesses who may be diabetics on insulin and so on uh, but a lot of people don't know that for example people with a very high um body mass index so people who are very obese can also be considered to be at very high risk um, so it's very well worth looking at that list and make, making sure that yourself and your family members are not on that. And I think um, our local practices have been sending out um, letters to extremely vulnerable groups. So I think, Athia, as you mentioned, and I think in the presentation as well about patients such as those who've got severe COPD, a respiratory disorder, severe asthma. So, G so the GPs should have already sent out letters to these groups to, to isolate themselves completely for 12 weeks. And that letter can, they can show to their employer as well. So they don't need to contact the GP practice either for that. Zakala, uh, Omar, are you there? Uh, anything to add from GP land? Um, yeah, I'm here. Sorry, but I've, I've just got in. I've missed the whole talk, putting the kids to bed. We had, we had a bumblebee. Well, uh, that caused a bit of 
mate. So, uh, Drama. No, well, there's nothing else to add from my point of view. Um, um, can I mention one more thing? I'm so sorry. Um, it's also, I've got quite a few questions and concerns and um, patients have been calling about up about the kind of drugs that they've been on so I think the doctor mentioned in his presentation about ibuprofen and anti-inflammatory but there have been other drugs as well that patients have been concerned about such as inhaled steroids so those are the inhalers that perhaps asthmatics would be using and they and although they are steroids it's a tiny amount of steroid that goes into the lungs and it is localized so it doesn't come under immunosuppressant drugs which is um it, which would be in one of the extremely vulnerable group patients so there's no kind of um worry or concern that that having inhaled steroids is going to is that exacerbate covid symptoms so that's inhaled steroids and then obviously we talked about ibuprofen and the other the group that sometimes I get sort of questions about is also ACE inhibitors, which is like a lot of patients are on hypertensive medications. And I've had a few queries that there might be an increased risk of death if they've had, um, if they're from, um, from having the um, symptoms of the virus and using these medications. But there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that there's a link there at all. And she should still be taking them. Another thing um, people have asked about is rescue packs. There's, there seems to be quite a lot of forwarded messages about um, people going to see their GP if they are asthmatic and requesting um, either preventer inhalers or um, rescue packs, which, which they wouldn't normally be using. And that's actually created quite a lot of demand on the, the system and um, quite a lot of our usual steroid inhalers are now out of stock as a result. So if you don't normally use a steroid inhaler, um, or have had previously um, had asthma, severe asthma where you required um, preventative inhalers, please don't request those at this time if you, mm. because you will not be at increased risk unless you previously use those as a regular medication. If you are not normally asthmatic, um, please don't request those um, unnecessarily. Um, and also rescue packs are also only reserved for specific patients. So um, again, if you haven't previously required um, oral steroids or antibiotics for um, frequent chest infection and so on, we wouldn't normally um, prescribe yeah, those. From my book. Because pharmacists are having a real problem in the supply chain and they really want to reduce shortages of especially inhalers. So, um, yeah, I think that's quite an important point actually, Adia. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. That's a really valuable advice. Um, uh, and thank you for adding to that and enriching the uh, talk with, with those important points. Um, I'm just going to very briefly talk about my experience with the illness itself, and then hopefully we'll be able to open the floor to the questions. I see we've already, looking at the chat there, I can see there's um, several questions that have come through already. But, um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to answer as much as we can um, of those questions. So basically in my instance, um, this for me today, it would be approximately day 19 um, after my first initial symptoms developed. Um, <clears throat> and the way that my, my illness developed or manifested was I had I woke up one day with a slight stuffiness, slightly runny nose, and some, some very mild sneezing, nothing significant. Um, day two, I felt a, a slight ache in the throat, but sometimes I experience aches in the throat if I, for example, slept um, and the environment or the air around me was a bit dry, and um, you know that usually lasts a, a couple of minutes, maybe to an hour after I first wake up and then those, that, that ache in the throat goes away, um, which is what happened on the second day. Um, but I was still sneezing on that second day. Um, so I didn't really put uh, that symptom down to being part of the illness and it was still pretty early. We didn't, uh, I, I didn't think that the illness would have reached um, this area so quickly. Um, but to be on the safe side at that point, I called uh, my workplace and let them know that, um, you know, I've developed some very, very minor symptoms. Oh, no. And just as a precaution, um, 
that I would be staying home to avoid, you know, just to see how things develop. Um, and but but as I said again, I was absolutely convinced at that point that I was fine. You know, just had a very simple uh, cold, nothing more. Day three, uh, the sore throat was a little bit more noticeable. Um, the sneezing had increased as well. Um, and then really from day four to day nine were, were the main symptoms that we discussed in the, um, the, the typical symptoms that people experience with the illness I, um, began to manifest and I began to feel. So um, high temperatures, uh, very high temperatures, 39 degrees Celsius and above. Um, a severe frontal headache, uh, it was an excruciating headache. Um, the cough, the, the sneezing, sorry, at that point had begun to abate. I, I wasn't sneezing as much, I didn't have much of a runny nose. And the sore throat had started to fade away as well. Um, and at that point I also developed between days four to nine really, I developed a very minor cough, nothing significant. I mean. Every few minutes, I'd cough. A, 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 I'd have a slight tickly cough, but nothing, nothing too worrying. Um, the main things for me between days four to nine were really the very high temperature, the frontal headache, the severe frontal headache, and the aches and pains. I developed quite severe pains in the back, the neck, and across the chest. Just generally across the chest, and it was tender to touch, so the areas that I was pushing on felt very sore and, and, and uncomfortable. Um, taking some paracetamol at that point did help. Uh, the temperature would go down. Um, my aches and pains did ease up slightly, but um, I still wasn't convinced at that point. Um, testing wasn't readily available, isn't still readily available for uh, NHS staff as much as we'd like it to be. But um, we did our, our my trust. Um, I, I'm based in North London at the moment. Uh, and my trust did have two uh, tests available for staff for that particular day. And I was one of the two people that was selected due to my position. Um, and, and, and just the importance of having me back at work. Uh, I was one of the two that was selected to, to, to undergo testing. Um, and the testing at that point was to see if I was currently with the condition, as opposed to someone who's had the condition and has developed an immunity to the condition. So it's a simpler form of the test. Um, after 48 hours of having the test, which was a simple swab test where they took a swab of the nose and the back of the throat, um, I was very surprised to find out that I was positive for the COVID-19. Um, it was mixed, mixed emotions because at one point I was um, slightly happy that I didn't really have any serious symptoms of the illness um, and at the same time surprised and, and slightly alarmed by the fact that I was able to catch this illness so, so quickly. Um, but from day nine onwards, my symptoms had gradually begun to improve. The fever was breaking, my cough was easing, the aches and pains remained, they weren't easing. Um, and sorry, what I mentioned, I forgot, failed to mention between days four to nine was the severe fatigue, the very fatigue. Um, but again, from day nine onwards, that was improving. So the only thing that was really remaining was the aches and pains. The fatigue was improving, the cough was still there, but improving, um, and the headache had gone and the fevers had gone. Um, up till approximately day 14, I was feeling almost back to normal, but still felt as if I couldn't, I hadn't yet shaken this illness off completely. Um, but but feeling feeling very much better by that point. Um, day fifteen um, again was a, was a surprise for me because then I very quickly relapsed. Um, when I say relapsed, I developed severe fatigue again, tiredness, and a very high temperature. Uh, but this time the temperature was again thirty nine plus, but was not improving with things like paracetamol. 
And for approximately 48 hours, I had a very high temperature that I just couldn't bring down. Now, contrary to what the advice I've given you, obviously me, myself being a medical professional, I was able to you know, keep a very close eye on that and not require to, to see, um, uh, you know, seek medical attention at that point, but I was keeping a very close eye on myself um, just to see where things were progressing. Um, I wouldn't advise you to do that, and I would advise you to seek medical attention where similar symptoms did develop at that point, like myself. But with the temperature, uh, as I say, that was a steady 48 hours before um, it, it eventually, thankfully, broke and, um, and subsided. Uh, and again, I felt like things were returning to normalcy again. It was, things were heading towards in the right direction. Uh, but that only lasted a day, and <laughs> so from approximately day 17, well, uh, sorry, 16, I'm, I'm at day 19 now, so approximately day 16, 17, I developed the, some of the gastric symptoms, so lots of nausea, uh, a bit of vomiting, and, and needing to go to the toilet quite, quite frequently. Um, and that lasted approximately 24 hours, after which, um, this was two days ago now, um, after which really the symptoms had seemed to finally break and I was feeling very much, slowly very much feeling, be beginning to feel my usual self. And uh, thankfully I can say today is probably the closest to normal I felt. And, and I think I've finally, you know, passed the stage where I'm likely to, um, you know, have any further symptoms from this point on, um, and and I'm able to return back to work. So that was my personal experience with the illness itself. Um, what I did in that period of time really was rest as much as I possibly could. I very much focused on natural remedies, so I um, took lots of honey. Um, I usually do a very traditional sort of natural remedy, which is a combination of black seed, oil, um, honey, and garlic. Um, these, are, these are just um, sort of home remedies and home um, things to help with, improve, boost your immune system and help just um, allow for you to, uh, uh, you know, support yourself during that period, ensuring I was drinking lots of fluids. Despite the fatigue and the feeling that I just wanted to do nothing and lay down, um, I ensured that daily I was getting um, some movement, some regular movement, um, not really going out anywhere, but, but by, by going up and down the stairs, for example, a few times. Yes, it was painful. Yes, it was difficult, but um, was an essential part, in my opinion, of, of um, you know, ensuring I was trying to uh, help support my system during the illness. Um, so those are some of the things that I did. Um, sleep was disturbed, obviously, but I tried as much as possible to get adequate sleep during that period as well. Um, and yeah, that, that um, really is, is sort of a summary of, of the experiences, uh, the experience I had which was a relatively prolonged experience. Um, you know, as I say, today is, is approximately day 19, um, where I think I finally overcome the illness, but um, from, it lasted a good 17 days before I was beginning to feel normal. Now, before those symptoms developed, I must stress, um, uh, unclear how long for, but definitely uh, prior to me developing symptoms, I was already unknowingly infectious, so I was passing this illness on. And that's the danger of the, the illness and why self-isolation or, or so, social distancing is very important, is because prior to you actually developing symptoms, you are, um, as you're coming up to the, the, the development of those symptoms, you are an infectious person. You are passing this illness to others. Um, and you might feel absolutely fine, as I did myself. Uh, prior to developing the sneezing and the coughing. Um, so it is, it is absolutely vital that at this t current time of the, uh, epi the pandemic, that we do um, really stick to the guidance of the social distancing because it is 
as I say, uh, uh, very important in avoiding that spread, that un unwilling and unknowing spread of the illness itself. Um, I'll pass it back to uh, Amr. Uh, Thank you, Franz. Um, so um, I think that was a very detailed description of your own experience. Uh, I'd like to open it up to the floor for Q&A, but just before we do that, there were some questions relevant to your own uh, description of the illness. So if you could just um, go through those quickly. Um, I don't know if you've got them there. There's one about the actual measurement of uh, garlic blackseed oil um, and also um, a question about the appetite and then if you could scroll back from there. Sorry, I'm looking here. Is it about, is it from appetite downwards? I see the question about appetite. Ah, yes. Okay, yes. So did my appetite change? Yes, as with most um, illnesses, my appetite did change. I didn't really have any, um, for up to, from day four to nine specifically, I had uh, absolutely no appetite. Um, which isn't a concern. Um, that's your body's way of shutting down so that it can sort of focus on dealing with the illness in itself. Some people sometimes are, are concerned about the, the lack of appetite, but um, that's sort of our natural, our body's way of responding to illness so that it can focus more on, on dealing with the illness in itself. Um, not to say that you shouldn't eat at all. Um, obviously, do take um, some, some form of nutrition, um, regardless of how small that might be, but not to be too concerned about a lack of appetite because that is a common experience with any, any sort of illness. Typically, the body will um, no longer have that need for uh, food or want for food. And as I say, so that en enables, that's your body's way of sort of trying to deal with the illness and, and try and put, focus its attention on the illness itself. Um, with regards to the black seed, honey, and garlic, I mixed those in exact equal proportions. So it wasn't any, any particular measurements that I took, but um, um, you, you know, I, I just measured those in equal proportions and mixed those three together. So the garlic was uh, crushed to very fine uh, particles. Black seed oil to, uh, was, was enough to cover the uh, the amount of garlic and an equal amount of honey to, to sweeten the taste and, and also for the health benefits of that. Um, what is the, I see, what is the, uh, again, with that, that's with regards to the illness itself. Are there any other questions I'm missing there that were specific to my illness? Ah, yes, ah, yes, I do apologize, sorry. There's also a question about the smell and taste, which I completely forgot to mention. Um, from day nine, um, as, the, as I'd initially uh, presumed the illness had uh, gone away completely or began to fade away, uh, day 10 onwards, I did develop a complete loss of say, smell and taste, um, which I failed to mention, I apologize. Uh, and that lasted a good three days where I had absolutely no smell, um, no, no sense of smell or taste. Uh, and that slowly improved until the day I relapsed again. And on that day that I actually relapsed, I had developed a metallic taste as opposed to a lack of taste. But that the metallic taste in the mouth um, lasted approximately one day. What the, the metallic taste might be for those more medically inclined, the, a lot of things within the organism start to uh, become abnormal, a lot of the, um, elements, uh, the minerals and the uh, components of the blood are altered during the illness. Um, and some of those things are like a raised ferritin level, but this I'm just being a bit more uh, medical here. Uh, so an increased ferritin level in itself could be maybe an explanation for why I had that metallic taste in the mouth, but that's just my own impression of what that could have been. Um, but yes, I did have a loss of taste and smell that lasted a good three days. Um, is there any other? Yes, there's another question about did I infect other members of my household? Yes, so my wife, um, again, approximately three days after I had initially developed symptoms, uh, seemed to be following uh, suit, 
um, she she began to develop symptoms. Thankfully, not as uh, severe as mine, but uh, but definitely clear indication um, that she was having very similar symptoms. Um, my uh, again, I have a fourteen-year-old daughter and a seven-year-old daughter, both at home. Um, thank thankfully, thank God, my um, fourteen-year-old really didn't experience any symptoms whatsoever. Um, and there are things to suggest that approximately one in six people might not have any symptoms at all, might have had the illness and not actually develop any symptoms at all. Um, being in the proximity that we are in the confined area that we are, the likelihood of her being exposed to the illness through myself um, are extremely high. So the likelihood is that she has had um, she has caught the virus, but not really expressed any any of the symptoms. Whereas my seven-year-old uh, did develop some very very mild symptoms of a fever, and um, and just some lethargy and a very slight cough, which lasted a total of three days and then seemed to completely resolve. Um, let me just go through quickly. Was there anything specific about my, how did you manage distancing at home? Yes, I, we, we really, as I say, the question is, did, how did we manage distancing at home with the family members? Um, and as I say, we, it was very difficult to do that really because by the time I had developed those symptoms, we were really quite in close contact beforehand. So um, it, it did seem a bit futile, although I did avoid any any close, um, I, I avoided as much as possible close proximity to the children. Typically, um, you know, they, they'd get lots of cuddles and kisses uh, through the day. Uh, that, that was something that was completely abandoned um, and something I avoided. Um, and, and they weren't allowed really to come close to me at that point. Um, as I say, once my symptoms really began to, when that, that sore throat was very prominent, my wife had already begun to develop symptoms. So it was, again, uh, you know, the, the benefits of social, you know, keeping a, quite large distances between us didn't really seem um, that would give us much benefit at that point. Um, so from my perspective, that's how it was. Um, I think that th those were questions specific to my condition. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll throw that back for, for additional questions. I'll bring that back to the floor. Ross, just to, just to add on to uh, that, was, um, there's a question that uh, cropped up was, what are the chances of it relapsing? Um, good question. The simple answer to that is we don't know. Um, we still do not know. If we, it is a virus. What we do know about vi most viruses is that once you do come in contact with the virus, um, your body, as it's overcoming, and the way that it overcomes is you develop antibodies to this illness um, or to this virus, to the virus, um, traditionally with viruses in general. Uh, and those antibodies are basically um, things which, which then over eventually overcome the virus and you become better and hopefully those antibodies then remain in the system, um, re remain um, in your body and um, should hopefully then prevent you relapsing or redeveloping the condition again. So were you to come into contact with that very same virus once again, your body via these antibodies will remember the illness and be very uh, quick to respond um, and attack the virus before it has uh, a chance to develop in the system again. Um, so that's, that's typically the, the way um, your body works when it is in contact with the virus. Um, because this is a, 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 pretty, a, a new virus, we expect that it will follow the same route as um, what we'd expect a virus to do and what we expect our bodies to do with the virus, with the development of the antibodies. But we yet do not know um, if that is the case because there just isn't yet enough evidence to, uh, to tell us for certain um, whether we develop immunity 
And if we do develop immunity, how long that immunity lasts for? Because the antibodies, if, um, if your body does not come into contact with that virus for a period of time, those antibodies might slowly fade away and you might, um, and that period of time of how long it takes for those antibodies to go away isn't yet very clear um, as, as we, we, we just don't know enough yet. But I'm sure with the um, rigorous research that's taking place around the virus, that those uh, questions will be answered soon enough. For us, there's also a question about lupus and um, stents as underlying conditions. Okay, well, um, would anyone, I, I, just because I'm, I'm aware that I've been doing most of the talking, uh, would anyone else would like to jump in um, and maybe um, and answer the questions that are more generic to the uh, illnesses, the, the illness itself? Yeah, sure. I can. Uh, this is Mizan here. I can uh, uh, help out with some of the questions. Um, so in terms of lupus, um, or more uh, broadly, it's the conditions of the immune system um, where parts of the immune system actually cause a problem within our own body. So there's a broad condition of autoimmune conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, um, and lupus is also one of them. Um, I think it's more the treatment for these conditions which can pose a greater problem than perhaps the condition themselves. So if somebody is on treatment that um, kind of tones down the immune system, um, so treat, you may have heard of uh, medications such as methotrexate or similar medications, then that itself actually can present uh, or put the potential person uh, who may get exposed to coronavirus or many other infections at a much higher risk. And I think, um, and from Dr. Faraz's uh, um, presentation, uh, it was uh, one of the high risk categories of people on immunosuppressant medication. And again, just going back to the presentation too, so people with cardiovascular disease, including those who have had it, have had a stent uh, fitted inside, they are also at higher risk too, just because of the body's uh, kind of ability or decreased ability to cope under pressure. So when the body's fighting off an uh, infection, if the heart is compromised to start off with, um, then with that added pressure, uh, the risks are naturally a bit higher. So I hope that answers the question. Um, so if you do find yourself or your loved one in that category, um, it's about trying to take uh, you know, the precautions um, that are advised um, or you know, to a high level, especially if you're on immunosuppressive uh, medications. Thank you, Mizan. There was also a question uh, just on uh, a similar subject, but with regards to dialysis, if you could comment. Uh, let me have a read of the question, just one second. Oh, do you have the question to hand? Are you able to read it out? Well, I can just go and have a look. I think it was about a participant's participant member of a uh, family member going in to have dialysis. Ah, yes, found it. Yeah. So just for everyone else, I will read out the question. Uh, so my mother-in-law has been taken to A&E unrelated to COVID-19. She has dialysis three times a week and was taken into hospital today uh, due to an irregular heart rate. Her temperature was 35 degrees. Will she be in any at any risk or danger of catching the viruses? She is 71 years old. So one small caveat I'd give, um, obviously the advice we're giving today is very, very generic. Um, and even when we are speaking about uh, specific conditions, it's still within a broad generic framework. Um, and specific advice such as, you know, I hope um, your mother-in-law, um, you know, starts her recovery very soon and she st stays safe and stays clear of uh, coronavirus. Um, so uh, very specific questions obviously need a specific assessment from uh, um, the clinician who's taking care of the patient. Um, so in broad terms, um, I think just if we go back to Dr. Faraz's presentation and some of the risk factors, there are risk factors uh, that you know, we can't change such as age. So we know not just coronavirus, many infections, uh, if we are of an older, from an older age group, then our body is less able to uh, cope with uh, infections. And that's definitely true from the data that we're seeing uh, from coronavirus. Um, kidney disease um, usually doesn't come, you know, if, if kidney disease is so se severe that it needs dialysis, usually there are 
other associated uh, medical illnesses too, uh, which uh, will reduce the body's ability to effectively fight off infection. I mean, the hope is hospitals are taking a lot of precautions and they are having designated areas where they are treating patients with suspected coronavirus. And the advice that's being repeated is if somebody does have suspected symptoms, not to just go into hospital or general practice, but to call 111 and to be adequately triaged. So the hope is, um, you know, those uh, measures would reduce the chance of people who are not who don't have coronavirus to come into contact with that. Um, however, obviously that risk uh, can't be completely eliminated. So again, I'm not sure how much I've answered your question. The short answer is th the list of illnesses you mentioned do present uh, you know, a higher risk uh, of complications from coronavirus and other infections. So we hope and pray that she keeps safe and um, this doesn't affect her. All right, can I just add something as well? Um, <laughs> Just regarding um, this, uh, the question where somebody said um, that they were not going to be tested um, because they had mild symptoms, so they won't really know. I think this is the main sort of um, focus of the stay home campaign is that many of us will not know if we actually have had coronavirus or not. And we have to just make the assumption that any cough or fever is coronavirus and we can't prove it otherwise, unfortunately, at the moment. So it's extremely important that everyone does follow the stay home advice. Stay home for seven days after you first develop symptoms. And if anyone in your household is affected, the whole household must stay home for 14 days. Um, and the reason for that is so that we can try and prevent as many of our vulnerable and uh, elderly um, you know, members of the community from becoming unwell. And the only way we'll do this is if people actually stick to that advice. Thanks, Dr. Atia. There's one thing I'd also add to that too. Um, just to, I, I know, I hope we're not uh, painting a picture of doom and gloom. I mean, the situation is uh, is challenging and it is difficult. Um, but one thing, especially when uh, I speak to patients who are worried about everything that's happening and they do have mild cough, cold symptoms, I think it's very fair to say that we are very much treating the patient um, coronavirus or any other virus. So if somebody does have a bit of a cold, a bit of a cough, a bit of a sniffle, just like any other sniffle, the reassuring fact is majority, the vast majority of people um, who get affected um, by this virus um, and by many other viruses, um, you know, our body is equipped, um, you know, uh, to overcome these infections. Um, so don't, if you have a cold symptom like you have had many, many times, we all have had, um, I, I wouldn't advise uh, one to get more worried than they have to, unless they start developing more severe symptoms as has been discussed, or if you've got any specific anxieties about pre-existing conditions, which uh, kind of uh, makes the situation a bit more worrying. Thank you so much again, um, uh, One question uh, that I had personally, and I, I noticed also popped up on the uh, chat, uh, was about smoking. Um, um, my own personal view, and this is just anecdotal, is that um, I, I know that uh, Italians and Spanish are, are very fond of smoking, and I just wondered if that had had any um, influence on the uh, susceptibility of the disease, and, and also perhaps mm -hmm. in this country might be an opportunity to, for people to you know, think about giving up. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I don't want to be patronising because I think um, we can be when it, when it comes to speaking to uh, you know, folks with a variety of habits. Um, so smoking is a risk factor amongst uh, other risk factors. Um, our advice, uh, I think, is quite well known of um, stopping smoking. Um, it's, it's much easier said than it is done. Um, I used to work in a stop smoking clinic for about four or five years when I used to work in public health and you know it's very very difficult uh, cigarettes are very uh, addictive um, especially now if we can take this opportunity as a motivation to reduce or you know stop um, for those of us who do smoke then uh, you know that that's ideal it will reduce the uh, kind of the damage that uh, our lungs are susceptible to and um, overall uh, kind of reduce the chance of uh, complications from any respiratory, any lung infection. Some practical ways uh, for those uh, who are thinking of stopping smoking, uh, there are nicotine replacement products, uh, which take some of the kind of uh, um, withdrawal symptoms away from stopping smoking. So these can range from patches, lozenges, uh, lozenges um, inhalating devices. There are also um, 
other medications that can be prescribed, something called Champix that can be, uh, you can get from your GP, uh, which also has uh, quite successful, uh, can be helpful in stopping smoking. But the main thing is willpower. So yeah, I think ideally in, in most circumstances and definitely in a context where there is a respiratory virus that's spreading, um, stopping smoking is a very wise thing to do. Um, just a few questions that I'd like to, uh, that I'm, uh, as I've had a chance to read through some of them, I'd like to just briefly go over as well. Um, there's obviously, <laughs> with, with everyone self-isolating or social distancing at home, there is an, a massive increase in the use of social media and floating about of, of a wide, you know, a barrage of, of various different um, theories about the cause um, and or treatments that have real, not really no evidence whatsoever. Um, so one of the questions is, does the 5G network have any, any effect on the virus itself? Um, and and the, the simple answer to that is, is no, there is no evidence whatsoever that, that there is any relation to 5G networks uh, having any, any association to the illness itself. Um, there's another question about vitamin C that I'm reading and high doses of vitamin C. Um, vitamin C is an, is an important part of our, um, uh, our body and our immune system. There isn't, there's limited evidence to show that it has an effect on improving outcomes or treatments of viral illnesses. Um, currently, I think there's a study, or they're, they're, they have done a study at, um, in Wuhan itself, uh, where they were giving patients high doses of vitamin C, but the outcomes of that are, as, as far as I'm aware, not yet um, apparent. So the simple answer is yes, vitamins, like things like vitamin C, are, are very useful, um, whether they treat or help in treating the illness in itself, I'm sure they have some role to play, but there's no evidence as yet there, or, or limited evidence to, um, to, to um, you know, in dealing with the illness or viral illnesses in themselves. Um, what else? There was, uh, I think, there was a question about self-isolation um, and whether if, if the whole family self-isolates for 14 days, does it mean that they're clear of the virus now? Um, the likelihood is, is, is if within 14 days, members of the family, um, obviously if you, uh, if the person themselves start to show symptoms of the illness, then within seven days, um, you know, after seven days, hopefully they should overcome or, or show suggestions that they, they're, they're improving. Um, the reason for the 14 days is that's the expected time frame for which um, others might, uh, or the what we call the incub incubation period, um, for which the you, you might have contracted the illness, but not yet shown any symptoms, and that can last anywhere from one day to 14 days. Um, so the likelihood of you developing symptoms after 14 days um, isn't yet 100% uh, certain, but there's a good chance that if you haven't yet developed symptoms after 14 days, then the likelihood is you're, you're unlikely to, to show symptoms, but it doesn't completely rule it out, no. Yeah, I, I've also linked a, um, a graphic, which is from the um, government advice. So if you, um, if you looked up stay, uh, stay home advice from, um, and find the um, government uh, page for that, um, there's a, a, pay, a picture of what happens in a household if um, somebody becomes unwell. So after the first person becomes unwell, everybody else in the household must stay home for 14 days. If somebody was somebody else becomes unwell, um, sort of within that 14 day period, then that person must stay at home an additional seven days after that to ensure that they don't pass it on to anybody else, e even if um, everybody else in the household can then, you know, go back to their normal um, routine. Obviously, everyone's still in lockdown at the moment, but um, in terms of actually um, household isolation, um, that guidance is actually quite clear and useful if you want to have a look at that. Um, I've linked it in the chat. Zaklak, dear, uh, thanks so much. Um, hopefully, people can see that um, in the chat. Um, if I could now 
open it up to the floor. If people want to unmute themselves and, and ask um, live questions, feel free. Uh, the panel are open to answer questions. Um, we've probably got about another 15 minutes before the sort of brief timed out. So um, if we could sort of aim to wrap up in the next 15 minutes or so, um, that'd be great. Okay, if no one's um, um, talking, there's just another question that's popped up that I can see about what sort of fruits and vegetables. Um, so with regarding to fruit, I would say, um, again, anecdotally, vitamin C, you know, things um, that are high in, in vitamin C content. So citrus fruits, uh, lemons, oranges, um, grapefruits. Um, and with regards to vegetables, so green leafy vegetables are, 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 are the best probably for their high content of vitamin C and like things like vitamin D, e, um, which are all um, immune boosting, enhancing um, med, um, vitamins. Um, things like broccoli um, are also quite important. Um, with regards to non-fruits and vegetables, so things like chicken soup also contain a high amount of, of iron and protein, um, which can also help boost the immune system. Garlic is a well-known um, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, food to help, again, improve or help boost the immune system. And um, things like yogurts as well. Yogurt is, is also would be, um, can, can help with uh, our, our, you know, things that can help boost the immune system. Are there any other, any other questions that people might want to ask directly? I have a question, Dr. Faraz. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, brother, uh, so it's all good advice. Thank you so much to you and, and the panel uh, for taking the time uh, to kind of uh, give us uh, awareness on, on the <clears throat> on situation. Now, you mentioned black seed oil and honey. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, on the black seed oil, instead of basically taking it raw, I mean, can, you, can it be used in cooking? That's the first thing. Secondly, the honey that you buy from the likes of Sainsbury's, uh, they contain, uh, I believe, uh, sugar. Now, obviously, my, I've got a family member who's diabetic. So what's the advice on taking honey uh, for people who are diabetic? And last question, which is related to it, uh, you mentioned that one of the high-risk uh, groups is people with diabetes. Mm -hmm. now, are we talking about any diabetes or type 2 or type 1 or both? Uh, if you can please just clarify. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good questions. Um, so with regards to black seed oil, um, black seed oil taken in its natural, it, its purest form is, is probably the most effective and most beneficial. Um, once you start denaturing it or, or changing its attributes by uh, cooking, um, the benefits might not be as, as um, uh, you, know, you know, as good as they were. Um, were you to take it in its pure pressed, uh, you know, you know, refi unrefined form. Um, so I can't really um, give you a direct answer with regards to how does cooking affect black seed, the, the oil itself and the properties of the black seed, as I don't have that information myself. Um, I'm sorry, I, 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 I know your last question, but I don't know what the second question was. So it was about the honey, uh, the use of oh, yes, honey, yes. So uh, honey and, and uh, sugar contents. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, I mean, obviously, um, you know, that's a tricky question to find honey that is as pure as, as possible. Um, uh, most of most honeys that you can buy will hopefully have enough of the, uh, the natural honey um, to, to retain its, its uh, properties. But, yeah, but we do know that there is honey that is, can sometimes be slightly mixed in with other, other um, um, elements. Um, with regards to people who suffer with diabetes, then the amount of honey that can be taken or should be taken should be very much limited at that point. So I would suggest maybe, uh, you, you know, minimizing the amount of honey taken, not to say that you shouldn't take honey whatsoever. Um, with regards to uh, 
diabetes and the type 1 or type 2 both effectively have the same outcome um, with regards to their effects on, on our systems and our bodies. Uh, it's just the different ways that they manifest. So with type 1, the body doesn't uh, produce the insulin that you need to be able to use, utilize that um, the sugar that, that you break down from food. And so therefore you need injections of insulin to help um, supplement or bring in that insulin from external sources. Um, with type 2 diabetes, that's slightly different in the way that you develop a resistance towards insulin, so your body's producing more and more insulin, and then at some point it no longer is able to keep up with that amount of insulin, and your sugar levels begin to rise. Overall, the outcome is the same if left untreated or not or, or poorly treated in the way that they um, affect our nervous system and um, you know, the, the vessels, the blood vessels in our bodies and, and, over, and many, many different, um, you know, every, each and every or, um, organ system of our body. So the end result is the same. Thank you. So, that answered the question, yeah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu. Uh, so I've got a quick question. I've got a family member that has diabetes, has diabetic, and also has an angina. I'm guessing at that point that will make her from those who fall under the realm of those who are shielded or those who are more vulnerable. With that being the case, how do you go about attaining an isolation note for such a person? Because right now she's got no symptoms, but obviously she's more susceptible to catching it. I'll, I'll leave that answer to my GP colleagues. Sorry, can, I, can you just uh, repeat what the conditions are that she has? She's got an angi angina, uh, a stint, if call it a stint, and she's diabetic as well. Okay. And she's also quite elderly in age. Yes. So, um, I mean, uh, does she require the note for any particular purpose? Is it for... for oh, purpose? she's working. Obviously, right now she's well. She's got no symptoms. But obviously, seeing as she's more susceptible to the disease, it yeah. would make sense for her to avoid going out in public or going to work? So in terms of isolation, um, as we mentioned the previous, there's, there's obviously different categories. So with the shielding group, they will already have received a letter, um, which, is, which can be used as a note or to, as evidence for their employer. Um, for other people in other categories, there's a bit of a gray area where, um, because the, as GPs, we do not provide um, a certificate unless someone is unwell. So if somebody is well, we can't say, they can't go to work. That's the employer's decision based on a risk assessment of the the um, the person's needs and their medical um, condition. So all we can do is provide um, evidence if which if required, so that the employer is able to make that decision. Um, and you know we don't we don't make re particular recommendations um, as to whether a person should not be going to work or not. Um, there is going to be another list of patients who um, we're going to be informed about this week. Um, probably this week or early next week, which is uh, the sort of second tier uh, of vulnerable patients. But we haven't yet received that. Um, but that advice should be coming through now. Um, I think if your relative is concerned about work and uh, their employer is insisting on, you know, a medical note or evidence, then it's probably best to discuss that with the GP and see what the options are. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for what, what we're doing is generally providing a summary. Um, obviously, there's a huge demand on our services at the moment. So um, if we had, you know, thousands of patients requesting these types of notes, we would be overwhelmed quite quickly. So what we're trying to do is provide the information if required. So if you have hospital letters or you have other information which um, provides sufficient evidence that the person is very vulnerable, then that can be used to, for the employer to make their decision. All right. So, okay. Thank you. So you can provide like um, um, medical history letters right. and stuff. So we can always print out that information if required. So letters and uh, medical summaries. Um, but if you already have that information, you can use that as well. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I've just got one question. Uh, just uh, regarding my mother-in-law, she was taken ill today and she was taken to hospital uh, with an ir irregular heartbeat. And she is also a dialysis patient, has diabetes, and is 71 years old. And we just wanted to know, is she in any higher category, as a risk category, because of her age and her dialysis and the irregular heartbeat? Um, Sorry, go ahead. 
for, for the COVID-19 virus? I would say that we have advised that people over the age of 70 are at increased risk. So they're not necessarily shielding, but they are more vulnerable. And obviously the other health conditions that you have mentioned um, are also considered to be um, if somebody catches the virus, then they may be at increased risk of developing complications. Um, right. So, you know, that, that is why we are advising those patients to be more isolated. Just an added note to that really is that um, just, just uh, I, I think the question is about your concerns with her being in hospital and contracting that illness in hospital. That's um, right. Yeah, obviously being in hospital, you are at a slightly increased risk of you know, um, of um, uh, being susceptible to another illness. With regards to the this particular illness, the COVID-19, um, all hospitals are taking absolute essential um, measures to ensure that the areas where patients who are suffering or likely to be suffering or show symptoms suggestive of COVID-19 to be in complete isolation from any other patients that either need to come into hospital or need to be admitted into hospital for other reasons. So the likelihood of her contracting that due to her being in hospital from other patients is unlikely. Um, having said that, obviously being exposed and being around people, and as we mentioned earlier, that you, can, you are still able to transmit the illness regardless of, of having symptoms or not, so there is that chance of obviously that taking place, but um, just to, to, to uh, you know, reassure you that hospitals have taken all the necessary precautions to ensure that those groups of people are completely separate from each other and shouldn't be at any point in any contact or in any proximity. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your responses on that. Uh, can I just ask one final question, if I may? Yeah, um, it's just regarding my children. So. Um, a couple of weeks ago, this was before the lockdown of the COVID virus, they weren't really uh, feeling too well. Um, you know, temperature, uh, cough, etc. We've rang the 111 service and they've advised us, because you mentioned the word cough, it means possibly that they've got the virus or the symptoms and should isolate. But then my son, for example, he had the cough and then he's got better, his temperature went away and just today it started again. So. We, we don't know whether it's the symptoms of the COVID virus or it's just a general bug. We're all a little paranoid now because all we hear is obviously the coronavirus and each time they cough or they've got temperature, we're thinking, well, is it or is it not? Is there, I, I know there's tests out there and the government are gonna send out tests, et cetera. But is there any telltale signs that we can look for? Uh, I mean, they, they've got a runny nose. <coughs> My son's got a runny nose, does that mean? Potentially it's not. Um, so uh, again, very good questions. And, and unfortunately at this point in time, there just isn't enough testing to take place for us to be able to safely say they have had the illness or not. Um, but what, what I'd like to reassure you um, is that as I said, again, young children are extremely unlikely to develop any serious symptoms of illness. Uh, both my two children um, had um, similar symptoms, or, or my younger child had similar symptoms. Um, obviously, in my case, it's slightly different because I was tested and I was uh, shown to be positive. But had, had that not taken place, I would have um, assumed that there is a possibility of it being the COVID-19. But having um, a definitive answer to that is, would have been impossible at that point. And unfortunately, at this stage in time, it's unlikely that we, um, uh, you know, anyone will be able to give you an answer as to with regards have they had it or not. Um, now, children very commonly um, and, and frequently will be will have um, symptoms of, of viral illnesses like coughs and colds. Um, uh, so, so again, they're very likely to have contracted just a simple virus previously, and it possibly could have been um, COVID-19 uh, this time. But the as long as there is no serious uh, signs or symptoms, which again are unlikely in a younger and a very young age group, 
than the um, measurements that you need to take or the uh, things that the precautions you need to take are similar to what you would do if were they to have just a simple cough and cold, um, yeah. which is just lots of fluids, rest and, and you know, natural remedies and uh, paracetamol when and if needed. But apart from that, you're, you're quite limited to, 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 the, to what else you can do at this stage. Now, 111 itself, just for information, um, and is usually run by um, the people that answer the phones are commonly not, not, not all of them are um, medical or clinicians um, and will go by uh, specific flow charts. So they're, they're following specific symptoms and giving the relevant answers based on those symptoms. So they might not be immediately applicable to, to every, everything. It might not be immediately applicable to your case, but the general advice that, you know, you know were there to be any, any serious illness that, that would be picked up on, um, and the general advice that they would have given you would have been appropriate. Yep, thank you very much. I mean, uh, just to add to that as well, uh, one of the symptoms or the things I forgot to mention was uh, vomiting as well. So I, I don't know if somebody says that they've been vomiting as well, does that outrule that the person's got the uh, virus? Unfortunately, unfortunately not, because as I say again, um, viruses in general will, will tend to have very similar, lots of similarities. And in children, that, as we said earlier, those symptoms are a lot less intense as with adults. So there are signs of were they to contract the illness, their symptoms might very much so be similar to the next cold and cough and cold, which makes it extremely difficult. So vomiting and diarrhea are also common features of other simple viruses, making it impossible based on those symptoms on their own to give you an answer. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you. I'll leave it there. I'll let somebody else ask questions. Thank you. There are a couple of questions about fasting while unwell with coronavirus. And I think um, just obviously it's not a legal opinion, but um, you know, if somebody is unwell, then they don't have to fast and coronavirus is no different from any other illness. So um, it, I, I wouldn't advise anyone to fast until they no longer have a temperature and are feeling well. Okay, um, I think we're heading towards um, wrapping up now. So if there's any final questions, um, get them in yeah. now. Just, oh, yes. hi. I've got a question to ask. Yeah, go for it. Um, if there's a person that passed away from COVID-19 and another healthy person below 60 and doesn't have underlying health issue, gives the deceased a shower um, with the Islamic ruling of burial, will that healthy person be at risk? Uh, very good, very good question. Um, so the evidence uh, shows that the virus remains, for those people who have unfortunately passed away from the illness, that the virus remains within, um, you, know, you know, is still present. Um, so there are special, if you, if you contact your local uh, masjid or mosque, uh, there will be special teams that are, um, you know, specialized in dealing with uh, people who uh, might have unfortunately passed because of the illness, who will then uh, do the appropriate ghusl or ba bath or shower, uh, according to Islamic traditions, uh, but in a safe and controlled fashion. So the advice would be to not do it yourself, but to contact your local uh, mosque for, for advice on that. Okay, thank you. And I've got another one more question. Okay. Um, women that are in labour, are they allowed a birthing partner? The reason why I'm asking is because um, there's been a change to NHS regulation due to COVID-19. Yes, at the moment, um, as it stands, they, they unfortunately will not be able to be in attendance. Um, during, during the labor itself or during the birth because of the risk of, of cross-contaminate or cross-infection um, yeah, and in line with the government regulations on social distancing. So unfortunately at this point in time, that is not, they're not able to. 
Okay. It's just because, I mean, I believe the fact that there's a stress with um, NHS staff, with midwives, um, of course, a lot of people in self-isolation. And I, I just thought the birthing partner is more needed because lack of support in that sector. Law. No, of course, the importance of having the partner there is, is essential and for, you know, for giving that moral support, for being present and, and you know, joining in that um, wonderful uh, experience. But uh, we're living in, in, in very different times, unfortunately, at the moment. And, and for the safety of both the staff and, and, and the general community, um, there has to be strict regulations in place that, that, that are uh, you know, blanket blanket um, sort of uh, precautions and unfortunately having a partner in uh, during childbirth is falls under that category so for the time being as it stands um, the, the, the safest precaution they've deemed the safest thing is for not to, for them not to be present during the birth okay just a little higher and brother hi dr Fields. any time for one more question uh, to myself directly or for generally? Uh, to you to you or the team. Okay, uh, I'll leave it to my colleagues to, to answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time guys. It's been really helpful. Um, one of the brothers did answer the question regarding a, a lupus patient. I wanted to further inquire. Um, if we know for a fact that met uh, metatraxate does suppress the immune system, um, if the condition allows, should they reduce the metotrexate level at this time in, uh, to perhaps uh, prepare themselves for such a disease, uh, prepare for themselves for the virus. And secondly, if a, a woman is pregnant and she becomes COVID-19 positive, there's not enough research to say what the long-term effects on the child are, but is it likely that the child will suffer from a long-term effect based on your experience so far? I can take that. Um, so just to answer the first question directly, no, I wouldn't advise changes to any medication, especially of your own accord. If you are on a, you know, something like methotrexate or a similar medication, um, if it was any of my patient, uh, the advice would be continue with the current medication and take uh, you know, additional uh, precautionary measures as much as possible to reduce the risk of infection. And if you did uh, get any risk, uh, any of the symptoms of infection, um, then I would um, suggest that you contact uh, your general practitioner, um, you know, um, or 111 uh, ASAP, much more than uh, any other patient uh, group. So uh, just to be clear, so don't change any of your medications. Um, if somebody had very specific concerns about their own health, then your GP is the first point of call to discuss that with. Um, the question about... Um, just repeat your second question for me. I don't want to answer the wrong question. Is it a pregnant lady is being infected with a coronavirus? Yeah. Um, Correct. What's if the a pregnant of woman, the if, if a pregnant woman is affected by coronavirus mm -hmm. and, and she's not yet given birth, when the child is born, are they, is the child likely to suffer from any long-term effects? Okay, so again, good question. Interesting uh, question too. Um, so broadly speaking, with some of the questions, uh, including this one, I think one thing that's really important to note is uh, this is very much uh, a, you know, a new virus and there's a lot of research that's going on and there's a lot of very fast learning um, and a lot of questions don't have obvious uh, answers yet. Usually for there to be a good body of evidence, it takes quite a lot of uh, time and uh, uh, you know, um, research from a large proportion of people. Um, and we don't have that given, given how fast uh, this has been spreading. Um, so specifically on, to answer your question, um, I think the answer is we don't know yet. Do some viruses or can some viruses cause problems? Um, uh, to fetuses, to uh, yes, some can, many don't. Um, where coronavirus fits in, um, the you know we don't know for certain. Nothing. I have not. I don't know if any of my colleagues uh, have come across anything. I have not come across uh, anything that suggests cor uh, coronavirus is a high risk uh, for uh, feet, uh, problems of uh, you know affecting the fetus. Generally, uh, this is generally majority of the. 
viruses that cause cough, cold symptoms don't. Um, not all, but majority. I don't know if anybody wants to add anything to that. Thank you. I think I think that, that answers the question. Um, and, and I do, do agree, I couldn't find anything uh, to, to suggest that, that, that an unborn child would suffer from the long-term effects, hence I asked the question, but thank you for your input on that one. You're welcome. Okay, guys, so I think we've probably only got three or four minutes left of the allotted time. Um, so if it's okay with uh, the panel and Faraz, I'd like to wrap up now. Um, just a couple of things before we go. Uh, firstly, I think Mizan is going to um, post uh, a link to uh, SurveyMonkey um, just to get your feedback on how this session was, uh, how we could perhaps improve it, and, and as uh, Faraz mentioned as well, just to collate um, kind of a, uh, generic um, feedback for um, improving the um, sessions. Um, secondly, my brother, uh, my brother Beza also posted a link uh, for donations to Aliman Center. It's one off uh, Go Cardless. I think I re reposted it as well, but it's further up in the chat. Um, and then finally, there will be a recording available, um, which uh, I will um, post on, well, all of the chats <laughs> available, the volunteers chat, the, certainly the um, uh, community support network chat. Um, but uh, it may need a bit of editing. Uh, it's also quite a big file, so I'll have to have a look at that. But inshallah, that will be available in the next few days. So um, any last comments, panel? Um, all, all, all I will say is just um, everybody for uh, to try and you know stick to the government advice of social distancing as much as possible. Um, ensure you stay as healthy as you can by by um, boosting your immune system through regular exercise and diet and good sleep and fluid intake and making sure you're drinking plenty and uh, stay safe and inshallah uh, you know you won't be affected by the illness in a severe way. And just a quick message from me as well is that I'm seeing a lot of patients or, or speaking to a lot of people who are suffering from quite severe anxiety over what's happening either because of um, maybe absorbing a lot of information very quickly or you know being on online and checking things very often so i think it's really important that everyone gives themselves a bit of mental space and to be aware that you know it's a very small minority of people who actually become severely unwell with this um so the majority of people will make a good recovery um and there'll be very few that are affected more severely but also just to be aware of how it will affect your mental health and also, you know, being at home in isolation, try and do some simple things to, to improve your mental health, such as speaking to other people, um, exercise and, and um, you know, obviously, you know, reading Quran, et cetera, as well, making dua. Absolutely. Okay, guys, so um, we're almost timed out now. So uh, I'm going to um, close the meeting now. Uh, Jazakallah for everyone for attending, uh, Jazakallah to Brother Faraz for his uh, excellent presentation, uh, to Dr. Mizan, Dr. Atia, Dr. Seema, uh, Dr. Omar uh, momentarily <laughs> for all uh, chipping in uh, with uh, uh, their advice and experience. Uh, inshallah we'll, we'll try and do another session um, and um, uh, check everyone's availability for that. Um, so um, yeah, Jazakallah khair again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam.